This is the Human Action Podcast, where we debunk the economic, political, and even cultural myths of the days. Here's your host, Dr. Bob Murphy. Christopher, welcome to the Human Action Podcast. Thank you for having me. So to give some background to people, a few episodes ago, I did another episode on, uh, I guess, what Mises thought of fractional reserve banking. And the actual uh, impetus for that was that Larry White, for some reason, Christopher, and I'll let you explain this, the story, he cited one of your articles on the issue of fractional reserve banking, and that's what set off another little Twitter war. So can you just give a little bit of the backstory there as to how did you get sucked into that conflict? Um, well, I guess it was my own fault. Larry White wrote a book uh, last year called Better Money, where he compares Bitcoin and gold and uh, fiat money and tries to figure out which one is, is the better money. And I wrote a re review uh, essay about it, uh, rather a long review. I thought, well, I'm glad they published it, but probably nobody will actually sit down and read this thing. But it uh, turns out that Larry White actually wrote, uh, read it and um, decided to comment on it Now we, on, on Twitter. Now, the thing he commented on was not really... Well, I think it wasn't really the main point of the essay, um, but it was about, well, what did Mises really mean? So that, mm -hmm. that's where you also entered the picture. Because I note, as Larry White also does in his book, that there is a passage in The Theory of Money and Credit where Mises says that there is, to cut it short, a, a resource saving, a saving on factors, on factors of production if you have... Uh, paper money, bank money of some kind, in addition to just a pure gold standard. And uh, so I just uh, paraphrased this passage from Mises, and uh, I don't have the tweet in front of me, but, but White wrote something like that. And noteworthy, um, a Mises-affiliated scholar in uh, the Mises House Journals notes that Mises was okay with uh, fractional reserve banking. So that's, yeah, that's basically how I got into this. So uh, White uh, made this comment, and then you made a response to this, and uh, George Selgin also jumped in at one point, and then I uh, wrote up a, a short Twitter thread about it, trying to argue that, well, actually, there's more to this essay than just this one point. Um, yeah. Okay, yeah. Uh, why don't we... Because it was then your Twitter thread that I thought unpacked some things. So don't worry, folks. Christopher and I are not going to here rehash the debate with George Selgin and, and Larry White. I, I, we've done that enough. But I'm curious, can you talk a bit about what the, the current currency school was and what they believed and like the connection to Peel's act and, you know, what, what Mises thought in terms of their strategic blunder and that sort of thing? Sure. So uh, with the currency school, we go back to... Uh, Great Britain to England in the 1820s, 30s, and 40s. And here you had a great uh, banking debate, basically over this issue that we're discussing to this very day, namely what kind of banking system do you need in order to have a, a stable monetary system, a stable financial system, and one that's also uh, conducive to economic growth. And the currency school is the side in this debate that arguably won the, de won the debate, at least nominally, and they argue that you need a monetary system where the amount of money, the supply of money, acts as if you only have a, a, a gold standard, if, if you only have, as if you only have gold as money or silver as money, as the case might be. So concretely, that means you should not be able, the central bank or the private banks should not be able to just print bank notes at libitum. Uh, they should be constrained to only issue new notes. Um, 
when they actually have an inflow of gold into their reserves. So that's the, that's the currency principle that the issue of banknotes should be regulated according as if uh, only gold was money um, in the system. So if I could just jump in, because I think part of the reason, Christopher, that it's hard for a modern reader to understand these debates is because the the financial system is so different. So back then, if like the gold coins are money, or like you say, maybe silver coins, if it's a biometallic standard, but let's just say it's gold coins and like that's the actual base money, prices are quoted in terms of gold, let's say. And then, but for matters of convenience and also safety, maybe people want to go deposit gold coins with a bank. Mm -hmm. And then each individual bank would issue paper notes and those circulated as if, you know, as a type of money. We, you know, whereas nowadays we don't really think of that, you know, it's like the central bank. But back then it was like the individual private commercial banks each had their own distinct notes that were hard to counterfeit and whatever. That's basically said like the bearer of this note can turn it in any of our branches and get a certain weight of gold coin in exchange. And so then those notes would circulate the community as if they were gold coins. And so am I right that the currency school was saying to avoid these crises, these financial crises, the bank should only be able to issue bank notes, you know, that are entitling the owner to one coin if they've got a coin sitting in the vault that it's like backing up. So all the community's doing is changing the form of the cash in their possession. Like instead of having gold coins clinking around your pocket, you've got these paper notes that point one to one to gold coins sitting in a bank vault somewhere. Exactly. Um the, uh, technically, it would be what they introduced, implemented in England, was a marginal 100% reserve requirement. Okay. But that's, mm -hmm. that is what the currency school wanted, 100% money of some kind. Okay. And they, so you're, the distinction you're making is saying once they like implemented Peel's Act, it was saying yeah. going forward, any new notes issued are backed up one-to-one, -one, but the existing exactly. stock isn't yeah. backed up 100%. Okay. Yeah. So then can you speak to Mises saying what the – what, the, what their theoretical mistake was, and then why Peel's Act didn't succeed in eliminating business crises? Well, uh, so far, of course, we've carefully only said banknotes because yep. that was really all that Peel's Act regulated. In 1844, when they uh, introduced or passed this act in Parliament, they gave the Bank of England a monopoly on the banknote issue and uh, limited the bank to only following the currency principle. The problem, of course, is that banknotes was just one, one form that a money substitute can take. And it wasn't the only form, even at that point in time in England, that was in use. You also have bank deposits, um, and these were left completely unregulated. The Bank of England could uh, do deposit business if it wanted to. Didn't really, it wasn't really the main deposit bank. Uh, and the private banks could is, could uh, do deposit banking as much as they wanted to. So deposit subject to check became practically immediately after the passage of Peel's Act, the main form of uh, bank money, of money substitutes in use in Great Britain. Okay, so just to translate for the modern listener, the problem was Peel's Act, yes, was saying going forward, it, if you deposit gold coins in exchange for a, a piece of paper from the bank, you know, saying this entitles the, uh, you know, the, the uh, recipient or the depositor, the person presenting is the bearer to a certain amount of gold coin, that had to be backed up 100%. But if instead you put gold coins in and you basically had a checking account and then they just said, gave you a checkbook and you had the ability to write checks, you know, that were like transferring claims at the bank level to somebody else's checking account, that that was not in strictly enforced as 100% reserves. And so since in the community, merchants would accept, you know, gold coins, bank notes, and now checks from a reputable commercial bank at par, those things then became circulating. And so the, there's in a, the, so the currency school's theoretical mistake, Mises said, was in not realizing that demand deposits that could be transferred by writing a, a check were economically the same thing as a, a bank note. Exactly, yeah. Okay, and so then the commercial banks were allowed to 
issue fiduciary media and Mises terminology and cause, you know, there was a credit expansion. So you still had the boom bust cycle. And so that discredited the currency school reforms because they were saying, hey, don't worry. Once we get the Peels Act in place, we're not going to have these boom bust cycles. And then they still had them. So it looked like they were totally wrong, not that their principle wasn't followed completely yeah. enough. Well, uh, yeah, and it even developed to the point, I shouldn't say developed because this happened immediately. You had the first crisis. I forget if this was in the late 1840s in Great Britain. You had a, a, a run on the banks and the and also to some extent of the Bank of England. Now, the Bank of England, of course, is supposed to follow the currency principle, but in this situation, uh, the bank went to parliament and asked parliament or asked the government to suspend the uh, the workings of Peel's Act. And this really became customary in a crisis. You wouldn't enforce the currency principle anyway, even on the bank notes, mm -hmm. because this was a a, a limitation, a, a straitjacket that made it impossible for the Bank of England to work as a lender of last resort. It made it impossible for the bank to rescue the banking system in a crisis. So we have this, just as a matter of, of history, this very strange situation that the currency school have fought hard. They have debated for something like 20 years over this issue. Then Peel's Act gets passed, and they, practically all of them, defend Peel's Act, even though it's, the system is still not working, right? We still have these mm. crises, we still have this flexible money supply, and they don't even really play by the rules, so to speak. They suspend the mm. act when it's convenient. But the currency school economists, those that are still around, of course, they die off at some point or stop paying attention. I still defend the system, not their uh, theory only, but also the system as it actually works. And then you can you can understand why people would say, well, this, it obviously doesn't work. So obviously the currency school must be wrong. And there must be some mm -hmm. other principles that regulate this stuff or that should regulate this stuff. Okay. Yeah. So just in terms of the history of economic thought, Mises was is it, is it your understanding like Mises was trying to like rehabilitate the currency school and say yeah. they were basically right, particularly in their arguments vis-a-vis -vis the banking school. And yeah. it's just that, yeah, their, their huge blunder was to, you know, not close off this one avenue of credit expansion. Yeah, I mean, I think that's pretty, I mean, Mises says this explicitly already in, uh, in the theory of money and credits. And in the later editions, he... So it's the same thing with more emphasis and again in human action. So this, I think it's very clear, to me at least, that uh, Mises saw himself as a currency school economist. Mm -hmm. And that this was obviously the correct, um, the cor correct position to take in monetary theory. And I also think it is first with Mises that we really but we really get a, a rehabilitation with the currency school because it's first with him that that the theory makes sense again, because right. he he extends the principle to not just to to banknotes. That's you might say from an economic point of view, it's really irrelevant what kind of of technical or physical form uh, money substitute takes. What's important is well, is it covered by reserves or not? Does it influence the money supply if you issue more money, substitute, money substitutes or doesn't it? And that's uh, that's the point that uh, I think Mises establishes very well. And that's really the point where the older currency school doesn't, uh, we weren't as clear, we weren't as, as consistent as Mises then is. Mm -hmm. Okay, so can you, I mean, like I said, I took a shot at spelling it out last episode when I covered this stuff, and then I know you did it as well in your tweet thread, but just to somebody who's kind of a, an outsider, newcomer to this field, it does, I mean, I remember I was confused to try to understand where does Mises come down if we have to put him in these modern debates among the Austrians or Austrian 
fellow travelers on, on this issue of fractured reserve banking because certain passages look like Mises is totally against the issue of new fiduciary media. And so you would think, oh, he's a Rothbardian, he's 100% reserver. But then other passages, it looks like he's talking about the virtues of fractional reserve banking. And so which is it? So I know, I mean, I have my views, but let me just let you go ahead and not me try to put words in your mouth. So, so uh, I think just to be fair to our opponents, our interlocutors, that well, yeah, you can't, there are passages in Mises where he is, it sounds like he is saying something uh, favorable to uh, to free banking. Um, the passage that uh, Larry White quoted, and that was the the origin of this whole exchange, this round of the of the battle, so to speak, was that Mises says that in uh, the theory of money and credit, that the the use of fiduciary media, the introduction of modern banking techniques, and the great increase in the supply of money substitutes meant that you could have a huge commercial industrial expansion in the 19th century without having to devote a lot of resources to gold mining. It's not because that you need a larger money supply in order to have a larger economy, but it's just the natural consequence that as you have economic growth, economic expansion, you have more goods and services being offered on the market. As to say, you have a greater demand for money on the goods side, if you want to put it that, that way. And that just makes it more profitable uh, to produce money, to produce commodity money, like gold. And uh, so it would have been natural, is what Mises says, without modern banking, um, to have a much much more resources devoted to gold mining and all these resources we can now use because we have modern banking to produce consumer goods and services that we actually can, you know, eat or houses we can live in or whatever. Now, I think that, uh, and there are some other points where Mises, well, at least you must say that you cannot definitely, definitively say that he is against free banking. Now, I think that uh, the best way to, to read this is that Mises was not entirely consistent throughout his career. That's, I don't think that should be surprising to us. And I don't think it really detracts from Mises to say this, that we have a great pioneering economist and he just uh, hasn't yet thought through everything when he published his first great work, The Theory of Money and Credit. If you look in later editions of the theory of money and credit, you have in the, uh, I think that's in the second edition from 1924, a passage that's very definitively against, uh, sorry, very definitively for the currency principle also extended to bank deposits. So that would run counter to a free banking position. And in the uh, final edition from 1952 or 53, you have his uh, added section on a on a return to the gold standard. How would you do this in a modern context? And what he proposes is essentially Peel's Act adapted to the modern American context of 1952 or 53, and with the currency principle extended to. Uh, to bank deposits as well as bank notes. Uh, and at the same time, in 1949, of course, you have uh, human action. And there in human action, he quotes uh, approvingly um, uh, a like a dictum by the uh, French economist Czernuski, or Czernuski, who says, I'm, this is almost verbatim, that he wants free trade in banking, he wants everybody to produce banknotes so that no one on earth will accept the banknote. So he wants free trade in banking because he wants the complete suppression of banking. And that seems to me to indicate very clearly that Mises is against the idea uh, that this kind of 
free banking system with a flexible money supply is a good idea. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, so I think you and I are in agreement and here we're agreeing with Joe Salerno's interpretation that there are plenty of passages, even up through human action, where Mises is in favor of what he's calling free banking. But when you read the context, it's clear yeah. that he's, he's advocating that because he thinks that's the most effective way to prevent banks or to put a check on banks from being able to issue more fiduciary media. Yeah. And so it's, that's hardly a free, you know, uh, an endorsement of today's fractional reserve free bankers like Selgina and White. Um, but then even in terms of like the 1912 theory of money and credit where he's got the passages in there, you know, the section about it cannot be denied that the issue of fiduciary media kept, you know, the purchasing power of gold from rising rapidly, you know, back when there was the industrial revolution or whatever. Um, couldn't, couldn't, I'm not saying Mises was consistent, but couldn't, you consistently say that? Like, couldn't even I say that as a as a Rothbardian on this issue to say, yeah, I admit that the fact that they weren't st stuck, you know, committed to 100% reserves back then when there was a, you know, a, a large increase in the demand to hold money for various reasons, the fact that the banks could issue more notes or demand deposits even, that did have certain consequences that, you know, maybe there were some benefits and, and harms from those and, you know... I, I still could say, argue the harms outweighed the, the benefits, but yeah. I don't need to just pretend yeah. those benefits don't exist. It's like, could, yeah. couldn't you just, uh, so I don't I, see I mean, why we couldn't just just to say that maybe that's what Mises was doing. Like he was just being honest and saying, yep, there were certain good things that went with this, but still, because yeah. even in the theory of money and credit, he says at the end, something like fiduciary media contains the seeds of its own destruction. Or so he says pretty, you know, strong yeah. language about why this is a bad thing. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's, I mean, that's a very plausible uh, thing to say. I mean, and it might, of course, be true that, well, I mean, it is true that since you have fiduciary media, you will not produce as much gold because mm -hmm. the uh, demand for money will be met by an issue of, of bank money. Uh, now, I I just don't know. I Personally, I just don't think that you can say definitively that, yes, this is what Mises meant. Sure. Uh, it's yeah. it's. Mm -hmm. I think it's uh, it's just much clearer later on that Mises is much more. I would say he's much more consistent in applying his principles, and therefore he becomes much more uh, clearly anti-free banking or anti this idea that it's a good thing to have a, a flexible money supply. Yeah, anti newly issued fiduciary media. Yeah, we could yeah. say yeah, exactly. Because even yeah, because in some passages he clear he does. He is prima facie pro free banking, but it's clear as a way to yeah. limit the issue of fiduciary media, which is exactly the opposite reason for today's free bankers for why they're for it. Exactly, okay, yeah. so I think maybe this is a good time to transition. You have another paper, this one with your a co author, Jonathan Newman, where you're talking about the definition of inflation and how Mises and Rothbard use different ones, but this is all tied into the same general topic. So, can you just explain a little bit about? you know, what you guys do in that paper, and then I'll probably have some follow-up questions. Sure. So, um, Rothbard in a passage, <clears throat> excuse me, it's probably, I have don't have the paper in front of me, but it's probably in Man, Economy, and State, as well as in America's Great Depression, he defines inflation as an increase in the money supply beyond an increase in specie. He's of course still working in a gold standard framework, right. so that's that's why this is an issue. And using this definition, uh, Rothbard concludes that well, uh, only paper money, whether produced by government or whether it's fiduciary media is issued by banks, is really problematic from an economic point of view. And if you and Rothbard doesn't really. I mean, he doesn't really justify this at any to any great extent in these passages. They are really just like throwaway lines almost. Mm -hmm. Now, if you just read that, this sounds a bit like special pleading that Rothbard likes gold and he doesn't want to admit that gold mining. So Rothbard likes the gold standard. He also holds to the principle that any supply of money is adequate to do all 
the services that money can do. There's no benefit if you are in one, uh, if, if the economy is in one situation, in one state, you cannot improve it in any way by increasing the money supply or by decreasing it for that matter. So if you hold to those two principles, then you have this problem that, well, if you, it looks like that it doesn't really matter if you increase the supply of money in the form of gold, you have the same consequences as if you increase it in the form of, <clears throat> excuse me, in the form of paper, of bank money. Now, in Rothbard's defense, his definition is not something that he himself comes, comes up with. This is a standard way of looking at, uh, at defining deflation and looking at what is, uh, defining inflation and looking at what is inflation in the 19th century. Uh, Joe Salerno has a paper on this. Um, and there is an economist from the Federal Reserve, I forget which bank, it's also quoted in the paper from 1997, who goes through the history of the term inflation that originally, this is what inflation meant. Rothbard's definition is really the original definition. This is an increase in the money supply beyond uh, the amount of specie, beyond an increase in the amount of specie. The question, however, then is for us, why, is, why should we make this distinction? I mean, money is money, the whole point of a money substitute, the whole point of why it can work to just use money substitutes is that a money substitute can do all the work that a, that money proper can do. So it looks from the economic point of view as if it doesn't matter if it's a gold coin or if it's a banknote, that's a claim to a gold coin. It's the same thing. It's both part of the money supply. <clears throat> now, um, and in both cases, of course, you would violate this principle of, again, of classical econo economics of Ricardo and Hume and so on, that you cannot improve the economy by increasing the money supply. This is, would be a waste of resources. Or uh, in the case of paper money, would be very uh, damaging and disconcerting. So what we then try to argue is that, well, the point here is what happens in a changing economy. And it's very different whether you produce money by way of gold mining or silver mining, whatever, a commodity money or a paper money, a bank money. And the basic difference is that with, uh, let's just stick to gold, the production of new gold is limited by the law of cost. You will only, as an entrepreneur, invest more resources in mining gold if you expect the profits, if you expect the income to receive the revenues to be greater than the costs that you incur. In the case of bank money, well, what is the marginal cost of a bank note or of a bank deposit? This is zero, at least in the in the um, in the in the correct sense, I would say that you don't have to devote any resources to producing to producing uh, new bank money. You can. It's really down to the decision of the bank manager, to put it bluntly, how many uh, additional fiduciary media he wants to issue today or tomorrow, or if he wants to contract this issue, of course. So we are dealing with two very uh, different situations. And now in the first situation with gold, what does it mean to say that the production of gold is limited by the law of costs? What this means is that if it is profitable for the gold miner to produce additional units of gold, this is really a consequence of the fact that the uh, population at large thinks that this is the best use of resources. If not, then the complementary factors of production would be better way to offer uses that were deemed uh, more necessary. 
by the general public and the production of such uh, of our non-monetary resources would be more profitable. In the so again, remember we're always in the changing economy. So in the changing economy, while it's correct, any any supply of money is adequate to the situation. But the supply of money still needs to adjust to changes in society. It can do this. You don't need to change the supply of money to do this. You can just change the, the purchasing power of money can simply adjust. If you have an expanding economy, this will be the likely scenario in most, uh, most of the time. Um, prices will simply fall because you have the same amount of money and you have a larger and larger supply of goods and services being offered against this money. You can, at each step of this process of an expanding economy, have complete monetary equilibrium since prices adjust. Since prices will fall, the purchasing power of money increases. But this is not the only way you can adjust. It is, of course, true that you can adjust from uh, one state with given amount of uh, economic goods in existence and a, given, and a given amount of money in existence to another stage where there are more goods in existence also by expanding the, uh, the supply of money. And what we argue is that so long as money production is governed by the law of costs, then we have to say that an increase in the money supply, so on a gold standard, is simply the as far as we can tell, the optimal way that the system adjusts to a change in the demand for money. It could have, it didn't it didn't need to happen this way. It could have happened just by deflation. Um, and it likely will partly happen by deflation. But it can also happen by an increase in money supply. And as far as we can tell, and, and sorry, and we can tell in this situation that it did in fact happen through an increase in the money supply. And that's, of course, that's not the case in the, uh, if, you, if there's no uh, cost to money production. Okay, so let me just jump in and kind of paraphrase and repeat back that, make sure everyone's getting it. So there's a standard principle that I think Mises and Rothbard all endor both endorsed, and you guys do as well, saying there's a sense in which, you know, there's something odd about money qua money that if the supply of houses doubles or the supply of apples doubles, the community per capita is clearly better off, um, you know, because we have more shelter, we have more food. But with mo the money commodity, there's this paradox where if you double the quantity of money, it's not that the community is twice as wealthy. It's just in general, you know, prices would double. And there's obviously distributional effects and things. It wouldn't be perfect. But just as a first pass, there's clearly something different about the quantity of money increasing versus any other commodity. So there's that element. Um, but then at the same time, you know, one might then conclude, oh, so why don't we just keep it fixed? And in and, and fairness, like fans of Bitcoin can say, yeah, once it hits 21 million, it's going to be a fixed stock and that's fine. And then if the economy grows at, you know, 3% in real terms each year, well, then you'd expect prices to drop quoted in bitcoins, you know, 3% a year, whatever, however the math works out. And that, that's th that's fine. You can have an equilibrium like that. It's not like the, the economy would come crashing down if everybody's expectations adjusted in long-term debt contracts. That's, that's fine. And that's true. But what you guys are saying is it doesn't need to be like that. And it's not necessarily a strike against the market economy that on a gold commodity standard, um, what would tend to happen in practice is as the economy grew and, you know, population growth and the demand to hold gold coins increased. If, if, the, if planet earth just ran out of gold, like if they're really just, if we had mined the last bit of gold and everyone still used the gold as money, clearly what would happen is just prices quoted in gold would have to keep falling year after year to balance the demand to hold gold against the, the, the uh, stock, the, the total stock that was, you know, in, in existence because you know, your cash balance, your demand to hold cash balances is like the real purchasing power. 
So if prices are falling, in a sense, people are holding more gold, as it were, in their pockets, even if it's the same number of coins. But in the real world, when we can go mine more, you're saying it's a combination that prices might fall gently quoted in gold, but then also that slack is, or that, that excess demand, if, if you will, is, is satisfied by going and digging up more physical gold and stamping it into more coins. And it's kind of that, that balance. And so w one way to defend that, to say that's actually better than if you just had a pure price adjustment is that the purchasing power of gold is, is more stable and predictable in that kind of environment where, you know, if, if you just want to know, well, how much do I think a, a, a house is going to cost quoted in ounces of gold 10 years from now, it's easier to make that prediction if you know if there's a sudden surge in the demand to hold gold coins, they'll just go dig up more gold coins because that, that tends to suppress the spike in its purchasing power or slow the fall in, in the price level. So I don't know, do you, is that part of, what, of your analysis, like in terms of just the expectations? That, or to put it a different way, probably humanity would not adopt something as the commodity money if it could just, if half of it could just disappear. Like if it was something that, you know, locusts could eat and then you just wake up one morning and, and half of it's gone and say, oh, well, prices could just fall. But that would be a very poor type of money if it was that volatile. Yeah. Yeah. And that's obviously true. I think I would say that should be a little careful with volatility. There's nothing wrong with the money that appreciates why you have deflation. Mm -hmm. I guess you could express this as a kind of volatility if every year it uh, whatever appreciates a couple of percentage points when this is volatile to this extent. But that's... Well, yeah, just to clarify, really I'm, I'm making a difference, a distinction yeah, yeah. between... I'm not... Uh, between uh, changing versus changing in an unpredictable way. Yeah, yeah. It, yeah, oh, oh, yeah. I mean, definitely. Um, the gold and silver uh, and uh, Bitcoin now are, of course, uh, very good monies or possible monies because it's the supply is, the stock in existence is pretty fixed. Uh, you can be very, very certain that there's not, let's say that there's right now roughly 200,000 tons of gold in existence. That's to say, in actually owned by people, not just mm. lying around somewhere deep underground. That's not going to, put, to suddenly appear another 100,000 tons of gold or 200,000 tons of gold. They're going to dig up probably three, four tons of gold, three or four thousand, excuse me, tons of gold per year. It might swing a bit down to a thousand or up to five thousand tons, but that's what it's not going to change. And so you have a very predictable supply, uh, and therefore also a very predictable um, value or purchasing power in the in the case of gold, which you which you just don't have in the case of fiat money, uh, or in the case of any kind of monetary system with a, an, an elastic money supply. Okay, so is on the narrow question then, so Mises thought it was in a sense a, a waste, a social waste that, oh yeah, it's, you know, maybe he thought it was, an, you know, a, a necessary, I don't want to say necessary evil because in other passages he says if something's a necessary evil that doesn't, then it's not an evil, but um, <laughs> lamenting the fact that, oh, it's too bad that we, to use gold, we, we do have to go dig, dig it up you know, because that was ostensibly the reason that using fiduciary media in the form of extra bank notes or bank deposits could alleviate that resource cost. Yeah. But if I understood it, were you and Jonathan saying that no, that that's not, we shouldn't view it that yeah. way? That yeah, if, if the demand to hold gold goes up so that the, so the revenue from the increased gold output more than yeah. covers the cost quoted in gold of hiring workers yeah. and you know, um, to dig mean, it up, that, that's, that's fine. Exactly. I mean, that's, uh, I think, a case where you just want to say that Mises was not as Misesian as he should have been, not as consistent mm -hmm. as he should have been. It is really uh, no different than me saying, oh, it's such a shame that I have a nice Mercedes parked in my driveway because if I didn't spend my money on my Mercedes, I could have lots of other nice stuff. I mean, it's true 
Mm-hmm. But the fact that the Mercedes is down there shows that I prefer the Mercedes to whatever, uh, a nice vacation or whatever else I could have for the money. And this is exactly what we argue. You have to say with commodity money, sure, if you didn't devote whatever 10,000 workers or all this machinery to gold mining, you could do other stuff with these resources. But the very fact that you do produce money or that you have produced money in the past shows that this was what uh, entrepreneurs deemed at the time to be the use of resources that best satisfied the wishes of the cons- of the consumers. It's, it's like uh, Adam Smith's famous uh, analogy that paper money or bank money is like a wagon way in the sky. But gold and silver money is very useful if you want to have commercial exchange. Uh, it's the it's a means by which you can in, have economic exchanges. Just like a normal highway on the ground is very useful if you want to go from one uh, from from one city to the next to go somewhere else. But if you have this highway on the ground, you're obviously using a lot of land just for the highways. And you could do other stuff with the land. You could have fields of wheat and have more food, for instance. Uh, And Adam Swithin argued that it's just the same with gold, except with gold, we can avoid this. We can have this wagon way in the sky, is what he called it, if we switch to banknotes. Because then we get rid of all the gold. We don't have to devote any resources or bind our capital, Mm -hmm. our stock in gold. Um, And we can, yeah, and we can do other stuff with it, uh, with this capital that we have liberated. But that's, of course, I mean, the reason that you have the highway and not a cornfield is that the highway is your preferred use of this, this gas resource. Yeah, and I suppose, too, it's it's extra ironic then in the case of Mises where, given his views as to what happens when you issue new fiduciary media, that it causes the boom-bust cycle. Because you could say, yeah, we're we're looking at all these gold coins, like as you said, like your Mercedes. And so I, I guess the defender of fractional reserve banking would say, okay, Christopher, but the difference is if I could get the same car services as a from a piece of paper that just had Mercedes written on it, as opposed to an actual vehicle, then wouldn't we take that? Because, yeah, I can make this piece of paper at virtually zero cost, and if I could get into it and drive around in it and it could move me places, and if it also looked cool, why wouldn't I do that? That would be great. It's just we don't have the technology. But we, with the case of money, we do have the technology. We can use these paper notes that give the same services as the actual gold coins at a fraction of the production cost. But for one thing, even Mises would have to agree, all right, but the trade-off, if you will, is that making those new paper notes, you know, that are issued in excess of the actual gold coin, the vault, causes the boom-bust cycle. So it's not just a pure savings. Even, I guess that's what I'm trying to say. I think even the best case you could take using Mises, you know, various statements as like your data is to say there would be a trade-off. That yes, if you had, if you substituted some of those gold coins for the paper notes, you could the resources you had originally devoted to mining up all that gold would have be freed up to, you know, give you more wheat or whatever, but there would have been a boom bust cycle on the front end. And so it's not obvious that that's better, you know, from, from, in terms of standard of living. Well, um, I think the, the basic problem is you need some principle to regulate the money supply and with a pure commodity money, we have this principle, it's just the law of costs, as we've argued. And if you have a some kind of paper money, you're completely right, it would be one problem, and I think most free bankers also agree to this. Once you introduce it, yeah, you will have at least a one-off inflation, or at least a one-off business cycle once you introduce it. But once it's introduced, you still need a principle to regulate uh, the size of the circulation, the size of the money supply. And the free bankers argue 
well, yeah, it uh, there is such a principle to limit it through adverse clearings, uh, through a principle of reflux, that a bank will not be able to expand its issue uh, beyond the demand for money. And, and our argument that we develop a bit in this paper, and this is, of course, a, a, a really a core point of contention in these debates, is that, well, there's no such principle to regulate this because these uh, arguments, these propositions by the free banking school, they don't, they don't work, to put it, to put it mm-hmm. bluntly, would be the position, our position. Okay. Um, maybe in the little bit of time we have left here, can we talk about, uh, I think there was a pretty big theoretical distinction that Mises at least in human action, I don't remember if he says this in theory of money and credit, but in human action, he does concede that in principle, even with 100% reserve banking, if there's newly mined gold that happens to hit the, the loan market f- relatively soon, like before it kind of just you know percolates to all the other sectors, that could cause a little boom bust cycle. You know, he says empirically, yeah. it's not a big deal because. Yeah the fraction of gold that, you know, the new gold brought to market is always a tiny fraction of the existing stock. And even of that newly mined gold, only some of it's going to hit the loan market first. So it's, he's saying in practice, this is nothing compared to fiduciary media, the bank's issue. But still, you know, he argues in principle, whereas I know Walter Block and William Barnett say absolutely not, almost by definition, economically, if people mine new gold, commodity money, gold, and then they save some of it by lending it out, that's genuine saving. And so if the boom bust cycle is caused by, you know, the market rate of interest getting pushed below its natural rate, how can that be? If no, people are saving gold coins by lending it out. That's what it means. And so we would know that the market rate of interest is not artificially depressed. People really are saving more. So do you, do you have any take on that dispute? Um, I, I think Barnett and Block have argued in papers that money is really a capital good, that pieces are wrong to save it. There's this, third kind of economic goods called media of exchange. And if you take that point of view, well then of course, uh, just by definition, mining more gold, increasing the money supply would just be increasing the supply of capital goods and that's just a form of saving. So I guess you can get out of it that way if you want to. I don't think that's a particularly well argued approach, and it's not one that I follow myself. Mm-hmm. Um, but I still don't think that Mises is correct in his uh, in his argument here. And Rothbard, of course, also disagreed with Mises and said that no, this is uh, this would not be a kind of uh, malinvestment. I think. One way to see it uh, is just to move to a different sector of the economy. Let's say whatever some entrepreneur is making a big hit with whatever new product he's producing, he's earning tons and tons of gold producing this stuff. And this guy is a very frugal man, so he lives on water and bread and invests all the rest in the market. It's a huge inflow of uh, of money into the credit markets because we have a successful entrepreneur who is saving and investing all his earnings. And is this that the bankers or whoever financiers receive this money and then turn around and lend it out. Is this malinvestment because they perceive a new source of of credit? Uh, I don't think so. This is just a change in the data of the market, but there is now a greater supply of savings. There's a, a lower social rate of time preference. Now, exactly the same is the case in uh, Mises, Mises' example that we have a group of entrepreneurs who are very successful in what we're doing. 
it just so happens to, to be the case that what we are doing is mining gold. So all this new gold that they are mining, their revenues, they save all this and they invest it in the market. What is the difference? I mean, there is the only difference there is between the case, the first case of entrepreneur producing whatever product, whatever economic good it might be, consumer good it might be, and earning money. And this case, where it's gold miners, is that you have a change in the money supply, a nominal change. But it's still a case of you also having a change in the proportion between savings and consumption. And that's the important point that you have also in the case of the gold miners, this increase in savings, this change in the proportion of savings to consumption, so uh, an increase in real savings. And that means that it is not uh, it is not wrong for the bankers to see this as an increase in supply. It's not wrong for the market to translate this into a lower rate of interest, for instance. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I mean, so that would, be, in short, be my take on, on this possibility. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, I think we got to wrap it up there. Just looking at the clock here. Um, so of course, folks, you know, we could keep taking this and then, you know, well, but then the response to that is this, and we could take it five yeah. separate steps, but we'll, we'll have to cut it off there. I'll of course link folks to various things, including Christopher's uh, two papers and the QJE one that was co-authored. Uh, I, I suppose uh, at this point, I'll just thank you, Christopher, for your time. Uh, my guest folks have been Christopher Hansen. So thanks for uh, shedding some light on these difficult but very important topics. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for having me. And thank you, everyone, for tuning in. See you next time. Check back next week for a new episode of the Human Action Podcast. In the meantime, you can find more content like this on Mises.org.